tonight at only eight months old, the Elizabeth Line is the youngest to join the wave of strike action. Businesses are worried about the impact, especially at Canary Wharf, which saw a big boost in customers when the line first opened. It was a very cruel blow to hospitality and all the other businesses that rely upon you know, the ability to move within London. A woman's body is found months after neighbours reported leaks from their ceiling. Pop star Lee Ryan guilty of racially aggravated assault of a flight attendant and assaulting a police officer. Okay, so run, run. Where's the dragon? I can see one duck. We're getting a 30 second. Nice Joe Wicks will be here to talk so. cheaper ways to stay Press fit. Right now, okay. And George Takei on the musical based on his life hitting the West End. Solely because we looked like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor, we were incarcerated. Good evening. Eight months after opening with much fun fanfare, the Elizabeth Line closed today, the latest to join industrial action in the capital over workers' pay. There was no service on the central bit of the line between Paddington and Abbey Wood. Staff say they're paid half of those who work on the tube and want the mayor to step in. The strike today has hit Canary Wharf particularly hard. Since the Elizabeth Line opened, the area has seen a huge rise in footfall. So businesses are worried about the impact it will have, as our political correspondent Simon Harris reports. London's flagship commuter railway passed a new milestone today. Less than eight months after it opened, the central section of the Elizabeth Line was brought to a standstill by its first strike. Early morning passengers were confronted by closed stations. I was just heading in on my normal day and then there's no train, so I don't know if I'll be able to make it into work, so I might have to work from home. Yeah, I'm running really late for work and I literally just turned up um, and it's closed. I had no idea it was going to happen, um, so we're probably going to take about an hour and a half more to get to work. There were trains on the outer sections of the line, but none between Paddington and Abbey Wood, after signalers and maintenance staff walked out in a dispute over pay. TfL says around 600,000 people a day now use the Elizabeth Line. For many of them, the daily commute has been transformed. Today's strike will be inconvenient, as well as a blemish on the line's short history. Two unions, the TWSA and Prospect, are angry that their members are paid less than other Transport for London employees who work on the underground. The unions point out that tube workers got an 8.4% pay rise in 2022, but the same offer to Elizabeth Line staff is spread over two years, so 4% for 2022 and a further 4.4% in 2023. Can you understand why the unions, when they see tube workers getting twice what the Elizabeth Line workers are getting, might protest? Tube workers are not getting twice what the Elizabeth Line workers are getting. 8.4%. We're talking about two years here, both last year and, and the year to come, and there's also other parts of the offer we've said where we will look at payment for additional skills. Are you embarrassed to be responsible for the first strike in the history of the Elizabeth Line? Um, absolutely not. Um, these are a great bunch of workers. Um, they're very proud to work on the world's first fully digital railway, and they've only reached this point because the company will not talk to us seriously. The strike was yet another blow to bars and restaurants still feeling the after-effects of Covid and reeling from the recent rail strikes. The owner of this business in Canary Wharf thinks the strikers are being unreasonable. The public sector was pretty much wholly paid through the pandemic. We lost nine months of trade and had to make very, very deep sacrifices. And I think it's a very cruel blow to hospitality and all the other businesses that rely upon you know, the ability to move within London. The strike is likely to mean tomorrow morning's rush hour on the Elizabeth Line will start late. Well, Simon is over at Mansion House where the mayor is expected to give his speech later and there are calls, aren't there, for him to intervene in this dispute. Yes, the TWSA union has written to the mayor in his capacity as chair of Transport for London, calling on him to take a personal involvement in the negotiations. And that's been echoed by his political opponents at City Hall. The Conservatives also say he should do, be doing more to try to stop further strikes. He became mayor saying that he would have zero days of strikes on London's public transport. Uh, and he's obviously failed to deliver that. So what we need from the mayor is for him to step up 
show leadership and put a stop to this seemingly endless parade of strikes on our transport network. A spokesperson for the mayor said the strikes uh, reflected the impact of the pandemic uh, on TfL's finances and the strict uh, conditions imposed by the government during bailouts. But uh, they added that the mayor would uh, continue to urge the unions to work with TfL to resolve the situation. Well, let's talk about that big speech that he's due to give tonight. And he's going to touch on the subject of Brexit, isn't he? Because he's not very happy about it, is he? Uh, well, the mayor's going to be giving a speech here at uh, the Mansion House. It's for a, a banquet hosted by the Lord Mayor of London for the great and the good, uh, the movers and shakers in local government. And he's expected controversially uh, to say that the government is in denial over the damage done by Brexit to the economy and to call for a fresh debate on the merits of rejoining the single union and the customs union, which, of course, is not Charlene Labour policy. OK, Simon, thank you. After complaining about leaks coming through his ceiling for nearly a year, a father of two from Southwark says he was sickened when officers finally investigated and discovered his neighbour's body lying in the bathroom upstairs. Geoffrey Bwachi Frimpong last saw his neighbour in March, meaning the woman could have laid dead for many months. Carolyn Sim reports. It was in March last year that water started leaking through the ceiling of Geoffrey Bwachi Frimpong's flat. His neighbour in the flat above had the same problem. Geoffrey kept asking the council to investigate, but as the months went by, every time they knocked on his neighbour's door, she never answered. Last Friday, the council finally agreed to break in. The plumber looked and we saw, I saw a hair hanging out of the, the bathroom door, and then he asked me, is that, is that a body? And then I looked briefly and I said, I think it is. And then what happened was somebody got a light and then they, 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 sh they shone the light on the, the person's body and on the head and they realised, yeah, it's a, it's a dead body. That must have been awful. Hey, listen, as soon as I saw it, I walked away. I was... I felt sick. The police say there are no suspicious circumstances surrounding the woman's death. It's believed she lived alone and was probably in her 60s. She'd been living in terrible conditions. Jeffrey took these pictures of her kitchen floor. It was covered with a thick layer of dirty, frothy water. So your neighbour could have been dead for many months? For many months. I don't know. For many months she could have been dead. The last time I saw her, myself personally, was, was when I reported the leak. If someone did their checks, when we called all those times, this could have been avoided, you know? Could have been avoided. The police and the coroner have yet to confirm exactly when they think this woman died. Southwark Council are looking into any records they may have of her, but they refuse to comment on why it took so long for them to investigate the complaints in the first place. The council finally fixed the leak two days ago. It took just a couple of hours. Geoffrey is still haunted by what happened. When I did see the body, it was right on top of my bathroom and now it's the same thing. Um, you know, I'm living here, she was on top there and it's adjacent to my bathroom and obviously we had leakage leaking all the time and her body was right there. So I don't know what's been leaking through. Jeffrey says his wife's mental health has also deteriorated with the stress of knowing this woman could have laid dead here for so long. Carolyn Sim, ITV News. Blue singer Lee Ryan has been found guilty of racially aggravated assault after telling a black flight attendant, I want your chocolate children, while drunk. He was also found guilty of assaulting a police officer by biting him. The star had drunk a bottle of port before boarding a flight from Glasgow to London City Airport last year. Joe Koshan reports. He shot to fame in Naughty's boy band Blue with hits like One Love. But today, Lee Ryan used one of his bandmates, Simon Webb, as a defence when accused of racism. He told Ealing Magistrates Court, I'm not racist, one of my band members is black. I've had black girlfriends and mixed race girlfriends. I was trying to be playful. There was no malice or aggressive tone intended. The so-called playful incident in question was on a flight from Glasgow last July. A member of the cabin crew refused to serve him alcohol. Ryan grabbed her by the wrists and racially abused her. Leah Gordon, who'd only been in the job three months, told the bench 
He told me, you're my chocolate cookie. I want to have your chocolate children. I was intimidated, felt a bit embarrassed, felt I wasn't doing my job properly because passengers intervened. Comments about my colour, even if he didn't mean it, it was still unacceptable. Ryan had already admitted being drunk on the flight and assaulting a police officer who boarded the plane at London City Airport to arrest him. Oh, Despite yeah. pleading his innocence, magistrates also found him guilty of racially aggravated assault. Following the hearing, the pop star tried to avoid photographers by running into a nearby primary school. Lee, Lee any comments, Lee? Ryan, who says he lives in Spain, was granted unconditional bail and the case has been adjourned until the 24th of February where he could face prison. Joe Koshin, ITV News. Police are asking for help identifying a man in relation to an alleged sexual assault on a bus on the 5th of August last year. The suspect seen here in a CCTV image boarded the N9 bus at Hammersmith, where he reportedly sat next to a woman and kissed her on the face. She pushed him away several times and managed to leave the bus after others intervened. The London Ambulance Service received just under 4,999 calls yesterday during strike action by paramedics and workers. That's 23% less compared to last Wednesday. The service advised people only to call for life-threatening emergencies while they walked out in a dispute over pay. And a former Premier League footballer who used the names of stars like Rio Ferdinand to entice investors has been jailed for seven and a half years over an £8 million trading scam. Former Charleston Athletic player Richard Rufus spent hundreds of thousands of pounds funding his own lifestyle after convincing friends and family to put their money into a foreign exchange, foreign currency exchange scheme. The founder of a Crystal Palace FC podcast has revealed his identity after more than a decade of keeping it secret. Thousands have tuned in to the Hopkin Looking to Curl One In show since 2011 to listen to team and players analysis. But host Dan Cook stayed anonymous because of fear of abuse and judgment of his cerebral palsy. But since revealing himself, he's had nothing but positivity from fans, as Antoine Allen reports. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the HLTCO General Football Podcast. This South London man used to hide his face from his huge fan base. But this week, after over 11 years of anonymity, the Crystal Palace football podcaster revealed his identity and his lifelong condition. I am someone who suffers with cerebral palsy. He says he won't let any potential judgment for the neurological condition hold him back. Football is the people's game, as they always say, and if you've got an opinion on it, it doesn't matter if you've played or if you can do it to a decent level. Everyone can watch and digest it in the same way. The announcement on Dan's new YouTube channel has had over 100,000 views. Dan was already a successful football blogger, but he explains why he chose a secret identity, so his viewers would only judge him by his football knowledge and not his disability. I expected, say, five, ten thousand people to watch the YouTube video and, you know, some well wishes, but nothing to the extent that I've actually had. And that in itself has been so mind blowing to me. There are over 160,000 people in the UK with cerebral palsy. Emma Livingstone's charity is trying to ensure society better understands that CP is a lifelong condition. People with cerebral palsy um, look like me, look like Dan, don't always look like people who need full-time care and support. And one of the things we're trying to do is change what somebody with cerebral palsy looks like and show the skills and attributes that they have and they can deliver to the workplace. Emma believes Dan's announcement can give other people with cerebral palsy the confidence to reach their goals. Down in the TV world, there are many presenters or reporters with disabilities. So if you were to get the call to join a mainstream football show, would you take it and how would you feel? It's not something that I aspire to, but if I can inspire anyone that does have a disability or cerebral palsy to go and, and sort of achieve their dreams within the sports media world, then it would be a great byproduct. Although many people receive hateful comments on social media, Dan's face reveal was welcomed by his fans. He hopes the positivity continues as his channel grows. Antoine Allen, ITV News. Still to come on the programme. The Body Coach is back with cost-effective ways to work out. Mr Spark has orders to kill you, Captain. He will succeed. 
And telling his own story, we speak to George Takei on Taking to the Stage. But first, described as the pinnacle of rock music, tributes have been paid today to guitarist Jeff Beck, who's died at the age of 78. The star, who grew up in Wellington, died after a short illness. Playing with the likes of Nile Rogers, Mick Jagger and Rod Stewart, he left a mark on all of those he collaborated with, as Sam Holder reports. Jeff Beck's brilliance was boundless. Every guitar lick had fans transfixed. Every strum producing a sound designed to echo down the rock and roll halls of fame. Most people know Jeff as the London lad who replaced Eric Clapton to join the Yardbirds. But before that, he played with another band called the Trident. When Jeff came along, the whole thing came together. It, it really did work. He sort of supercharged everyone. We had such empathy in the band. If Jeff started on a lick, the drummer would follow him. Or if the drummer did something, Jeff would follow the drums. And it was that sort of empathy. We worked really well together. Jeff's greatness was the glue between genres and generations. Heavy metal, jazz, rock, punk. Jeff could play it all. No wonder his fingers and thumbs were insured for seven million pounds. He just had great control over, over the guitar and it seems like limitless power as well. It would be clean, it, it would distort and then it would go into various levels of, um, of that. A brilliant tone meister and I, I, in a way he's reinvented the instrument for us. Jeff made playing guitar look easy but when he picked up this prize in 2011 he gave a shout out to the London College where it all began and didn't sugarcoat how he started out. I'm here not because I was a success as a child prodigy, but because of my failure at an early age. I did make my first guitar and received two shocks. One when I found I hadn't earthed it properly and the second when my father smashed it up and threw, <laughs> he threw it out uh, of the window telling me I needed to get a proper job. He'll be remembered as the guitarist everyone wanted to play with, the artist that everyone wanted to see. Next tonight to our guest, his lockdown training sessions earned him an MBE, providing a much needed lifeline to families everywhere. Okay, so run, run, where's the dragon? I can see one, duck! We're getting a 30 seconds of just nice big arm circles. Press the turbo button now, OK? Turbo, come on, turbo, 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 quick! Gosh, I remember trying to get my two involved in that. Um, well, well, Joe Wicks is taking on a new challenge, opening his first ever fitness studio in Shoreditch and educating people on affordable ways to keep fit and boost mental health. Joe, it's an absolute pleasure Thank to you have you in me. the studio. It's the first time we've been here because the last time we did this, you were on Zoom. Obviously, yeah, it was on Zoom and this yeah. is, um, it's nice to be back, but thanks for inviting me on. And it's funny seeing myself in all those costumes because <laughs> they were so hot, those big sort of <laughs> Superman, Spider-Man outfits. But I'm not doing that at the studios. I'm no, oh, I'm sure we'll all be disappointed, but we did appreciate you doing it back then. But look, at the moment, every penny counts for so many families up and down the country. And, and despite what so many people and households are going through, it is important to, to keep in mind our physical and mental health, isn't it? Definitely. I've been talking a lot about this on social media recently that, you know, if exercise to you felt optional last year, like this year it's essential because we have to take care of our mental health and our physical health. And life can feel hard and challenging, right? And when you exercise, I always see it as like a pressure release valve. It's releasing stress and negative energy. And, you know, the motivation and the energy you want is at the end of a workout. So yeah. I'm trying to promote home workouts again because you don't need a gym membership and expensive equipment. You can really do it in your living room like we did back in the day. Yeah. And um, it's, 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 it's accessible and it's also achievable to continue. Because you know? there'll be a lot of people who've swapped their expensive gym membership for, for heating their homes, for example. So is it important for you to still offer free content? Definitely, I'm always thinking about that. I'm always thinking about sharing budget recipes and you know ideas that are going to help people on a, on a low income. And also, you know, obviously your food is going to be your your food's going to suffer. You know, with, with the cost of living, it's going to affect the food you eat. But it doesn't have to stop you from moving your body because your body is the gym. And I've been doing workouts today in my in my living room with a tiny little mat to show that you know you can have a great 20 minute workout and you should not. Don't let the cost of living crisis affect your mental health and your physical health. Like you have to keep moving, and it might seem like the last thing you want to do, but it's yeah. going to really help you get through difficult times. Because, because that link between between physical and mental health is so strong, isn't it? Yeah, it's not just like trainers saying, "Oh, you know, exercise to feel good." You know, there's so much science now around.
around you know what is going on in the brain when we exercise yeah. it, it fundamentally changes the way you perceive the world and how you see things so you know if you are down and you're struggling turn to exercise it could be a walk it could be a, a bike ride with the kids yeah. all movement is good for you and um, I'm always going to promote that because it's so important for you well I'm going to throw down a challenge in, in, in that case because there'll be a lot of people that are sat on the sofa watching this having finished work or what have you or giving the kids their tea so if they're sat on the sofa or sat in a chair at home are there any exercises that, that they can do to sort of get the blood pumping around the body I am wearing skinny fit jeans so I can't <laughs> do too much they might rip but like a good a good exercise you know just get your heart rate going and just like obviously to use your legs just a yeah. simple squat so, in and out of the chair, so oh you can God. just sort of. I'm attached to leads you're here, but I'll your try. Hip leads out. I'll just a try. simple squat because you know legs, big muscle groups. Yeah. And you've got to wake them up sometimes. Okay. You've been using them for a while, so just squatting is a great one. Yeah. If you, if, if you fancy sitting down, doing something a bit more casual, you could do some little punches. Okay. Little cardio punches and yeah. just some gentle little up shoulder raises. Even just taking your joints through the motion, you know, for the range of motion yeah. is good for you. So look, I always say all okay. movement's good for you, and um, just find what you love and just keep at it. Oh, I'll tell you what, Jar, to that, I shall need a lie down there. Are you joking? <laughs> it's been an utter pleasure to have you in the studio. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Jay. OK, now who? Now to a star. We've had a fitness star, but now to another star who needs no introduction. It's George Takei, of course. He has graced our screens for decades and is perhaps best known, of course, as Mr Suli from, from Star Trek. But now the star is switching from screen to stage in order to tell his own story, that of his experience at an internment camp in America in the Second World War. Rex Martel went to meet him at Charing Cross Theatre. Best known for the futuristic Star Trek, George Takei has come back down to Earth with a true story set in his own past at the start of World War II. It's about what happened in the United States right after Pearl Harbor. We are Japanese Americans. My mother was born in Sacramento, my father was a San Franciscan, my brother, sister and I, the three of us, were born in Los Angeles. We're Americans. but because it was Japan that bombed Pearl Harbor, and solely because we looked like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor, we were incarcerated in barbed wire prison camps, and with no charges, no trial, no due process, 120,000 Japanese Americans on the West Coast were summarily rounded up and imprisoned in 10 barbed wire prison camps in some of the most hellish, desolate places in the country. The story of this hell is rarely told. Takei was just five when his family was rounded up in California. He then spent his childhood fenced inside two different internment camps. Why do you think not that many people know about this? It's a shameful chapter of American history and uh, it was not taught in our schools. Mr. Sulu, set course for the colony. In his role as Mr. Sulu in Star Trek, Takei went on to become one of the most famous Japanese Americans in the world. All new evacuees must proceed to the infirmary for medical examinations. How does this rank in terms of your own career? I guess you're, you're, you're best known for Star Trek, but do you, is this more important than that, would you say? I, absolutely it is, because it's the story of democracy and both its shining qualities, but also its fallibility. Telly Leung plays the young Takei in the musical Allegiance. Had it not been for people like George Takei, I wouldn't have a career. I wouldn't be here, you know? So it is not lost on me that I get to have this opportunity to share a stage with the very person that has opened all of those doors for me to be able to do this. This play was a hit on Broadway and is now transferring to London with Takei, a sprightly, 85-year-old. You seem to be getting younger as you go on. I think on. it's in my blood. <laughs> my grandmother celebrated 104 birthdays, and I'm a very competitive guy. I'm going to beat my grandmother. <laughs> you also seem to be very excited to be in London. How are you finding it? What's your favourite part of London? There are so many wonderful things about uh, London, but there's the West End, and I'm a theatre person. I love coming to see the best theater in the English language here. George Takei's Allegiance opens at the Charing Cross Theater next week. Rex Martel, NTV News. What an incredible man. Right, time now for the weather. Here's Sally.
ITV London weekday weather is sponsored by Octopus Electric Vehicles. Car, charger and energy. Hello, a very good evening to you. I hope you had a lovely day. Didn't get too wet. It's staying unsettled over the next few days, apart from tomorrow, which offers a little bit of a brief relief. More on that in a moment. Still very windy at times. And as we go through to Sunday and the start of next week, things are turning colder. You can see the return of some frost, maybe even some wintry showers. It is a few days off, though, and we'll give you more detail on that as things develop. Back for tonight, though, or back to tonight, after that wet old day, a much drier end and overnight. You you can see there's a few showers around but not as much as we've had during the daytime uh, and we are going to see quite a windy night and that could well uh, make things rattle a bit so possibly waking you up if you're a little bit of a light sleeper not too cold as we start the day tomorrow we should be frost free although temperatures still uh, well into single figures and tomorrow does look set, a, set to be a better picture than today we've got some sunshine in the mix now there is patchy cloud around you can see the odd bit of blue might get a shower, but you'd be pretty unlucky too. Most of us will stay dry. Windy again though, particularly in the morning. We'll see those winds ease a little bit into the afternoon, but it's two or three degrees colder tomorrow than today. And with the wind as well, we will just feel a little bit of a chill effect, but still might not be too bad to get your washing out. And then for the evening, if you've got plans for your Friday night, it does look to be staying quite nice and dry. However, Overnight on Friday into Saturday, we are going to see further rain. So a wet and miserable start to the weekend with some very strong winds as well, possibly gales. We're just keeping an eye on that. Improving into the afternoon, staying unsettled uh, for Sunday, although slightly drier and brighter. But look at those temperatures really coming down both by day and by night. That's it. I'll see you later on. Cheerio. ITV London Weekday Weather is sponsored by Octopus Electric Vehicles. And just before we go, Arsenal have revealed the new artwork, which will be displayed around the Emirates Stadium. Contributors to the project include a Turner Prize winner, a critically acclaimed visual artist and a preeminent graphic designer, all of whom are Arsenal fans. OK, that's it from us. We're back with the latest after ITV News at 10. Mary's got your ITV evening news next, but for me and the rest of the London team, enjoy your evening. Bye bye. <laughs>